Blessed Monday and blessed February. We give thanks to God for a new month. And it also is Black History Month. So we, um, while we're not reading a book by a, a Black author, we can encourage one another to reach out this month and, and read something new from a new perspective. Um, it's important in our times. And maybe we can put a few of those in our newsletter too of what some options for people to read. But in the meantime, let us gather in prayer once again. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son. You have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you'd keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Praise to the blessed and holy Trinity, one God who gives us life, salvation, and resurrection. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship and praise. Be still and know that I am God. We continue with our Learning to Walk in the Dark by Barbara Brown Taylor. We're in the chapter on hampered by brilliance. Um, we talked a little bit about Psalm 8 and the, the view of the, United, the world from space and the importance of those rhythms that we'll dig in a little bit more in depth now into this chapter. So we had inter some introductory themes and now we'll dive in a little bit. So bear with me here. So there, as she says now on page 61, those of you are following along, as anyone who has Whoever took a biology class knows human beings are deruno creatures. I'm making up the pronunciation with eyes adapted to light. I know I mentioned this last week, but I wanted to repeat a little bit. When we go out at night, we need to see the light. Many, we need light to see. Many of the creatures we glimpse in the beams of our headlights or flashlights are nocturnal creatures with eyes adapted to darkness. They need very little light to see. For these reasons and more, it is we and not they who have been who have bent the physical world to meet our particular needs. We are the human engineers who have filled the night with light so that our eyes work no matter what time it is. Make you think about what we've adapted the world to and what the long-term consequences is. So she she mentioned of uh, the floodlights that a neighbor just had put in in their backyard and it impacts her backyard too by having this brilliant floodlight and it would and it impacts um, not just the security of her house but it also it impacts the the fact that the owls can't fly in the same way through her yard um, or the night blooming flowers might be impacted by that light it's not giving a welcome necessarily the same way to the woods where you can see all those bright eyes as they come out, how it impacts us, how it impacts the balance of nature, how it impacts um, the, those we share our space with outside of our home. And then she says this, it helps to remember that my fury is a luxury. If I did not have lights, I would miss them. There are so many places in the world where poverty and darkness are synonymous, where the absence of electricity means that people die sooner than they have to for all sorts of preventable reasons and rural women spend their whole lives doing things by hand that their city sisters do by flipping a switch. When the writer's, writer James Agney visited a country burial ground in Alabama during the years before rural electrification, he found women's graves decorated with dinner plates, butter dishes, and baskets made of milk glass. Others were marked with things people in those places dreamed of but never had in life, 
On one grave, he found a blown out light bulb screwed with it screwed into a red clay, the red clay in the exact center of it. On one or two others, insulators of blue green glass. The brighter spots on earth have never been the places where the most people live, but rather the places where the most prosperous people live. There, where there is money and power enough to light the night, darkness does not stand a chance. That is why it is so important for those of us with the resources to have our nyctophobia, our fear of the night, it's N-Y-C-T-O phobia. The name of our dread comes from Nyx, the daughter of chaos, one of the earliest and scariest gods of the Greeks. Her job was to ride across the sky at day's end on a chariot drawn by two pitch dark horses, drawing the curtain of night behind her as she went. The names of her children reveal the, their mother's character, sleep, death, tribe of dreams, strife, doom, and depending on whom you ask, Eros as well. Nyx conceived all those babies by herself. The only two children she had with another God were named Light and Day. Thus the Greek, Greek myth, as well as the book of Genesis, light, darkness precedes light. Uh, if that list of Nix's offspring reveals anything, it is how long people have associated night with death and, and all its cousins. Even now, physicians recognize something called sudden unexplained nocturnal death syndrome, in which death is caused by a ventricular fibrillation wrought by an extreme terror during one of the REM phases, REM phases of sleep. But most of us do not have to go that far to see Nix's children got their names. We all, all we have to do is wake up in the middle of the night and find ourselves unable to go back to sleep so that we have several free hours to obsess about everything from how we will pay our visa bills to who will take care of us when we can no longer take care of ourselves. Sometimes when I wake up in the morning, I find a list by my bed that says, man, mammogram, cat's the vet, update will, clean refrigerator, increase pension, pray more, quarterly tax, cancel Hulu. When does Nick sleep? There is one care for me on nights like this, and this is when she goes outside and just reminds of her place in the universe by looking up at the stars. And then this interesting quote, by looking up at the stars, um, the poet Lee Young, Lee Young Lee said, all light is late, reminding me how long it takes for starlight to reach my eyes. When I watch a star fall, I am watching a funeral that take, took place a long, long time ago. Stars are light years away. Galaxies are millions of times that far away. Rhett Calmo, who was an astronomy, who is to astronomy what Li Young Li is to poetry, tells me that I could find Quasar 3C273 in my backyard telescope. I would be pointing at a point, looking at a point of life light that started heading my way more than one and a half billion years ago. Compared to that, the sun is the newborn. Hundreds of thousands of stars flared up and burned out before the Milky Way galaxy del delivered her first sun. All these years later, every atom on earth comes from the sky I'm looking at. Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, iron, are the basic building blocks of everything from the, the high peaks of the Himalayas to the hollow flutes of my bones. If I cannot imagine eternal life in any other way, I can start with the carbon atom, since every one that ever existed is still around here somewhere. It may, be, may have spent some time in a rock before taking up residence in the ocean, then crashed everything, cashed everything in for a spell in the atmosphere before moving to a plant and then a human body. Whether that body ends up in fire or earth, the carbon will go on living joining up with a couple of oxygen atoms for one leg of the journey before taking up with some made, some made of nitrogen or hydrogen for the next. Every one of these atoms came to earth from the heavens. The lead in my pencils might as, might as well declare that it is made in Orion as made in China. So let's um, stop reading there. So this is Maybe got some of you wondering and thinking, why are we reading about these things in <laughs> morning devotion? But um, 
there's a few things, the equity part in the very beginning, of course, of when we think about our light, we're thinking about our privilege. Um, I do remember one time, Guatemala story, it's my best stories of poverty and light and darkness. There was a, a death in the, in the ravine where one of our churches were in Guatemala City. So this is Guatemala City, 7 million people live there and there's pockets with no electricity. So they had no electricity in the ravine, um, but they had it on the top of the ravine. And there was a, a, what somebody was killed by a gang, a member of our church was killed by a gang. And so they brought his body back and they were gonna hold vigil before they buried him the next day. And they found cables like extension cords and they brought it from the top of the ravine and they brought this extension cord all the way to this person's house. And then they made a makeshift roof over the patio because they had, um, because of one of the hurricanes, they didn't have a, a very good roof anymore. So they put, they found sheet metal in the other neighbors and brought and made a roof over the top because it was rainy season. And they put the roof up and then they had the extension cord and then they found light bulbs and they strung light bulbs in this one little patch of patio um, in the middle of a ravine, in the middle of a city of 7 million, and only that patch had light. And that's where the vigil was. That was where the, the grieving and the, the, mourn, the professional almost mourning happened. And it was so amazing that how quickly they were able to get light there, and yet they don't have light every day. They did without it, except for in these circumstances, um, such as a, a death, preparing for that. Um, and the utter privilege that we all took for granted up on top of the ravine, day in and day out. And yet there, it was a collaborative effort to be able to light, bring light into the darkness of that death. Um, other examples of, in the, some of the rural villages, there was, um, they hand ground the corn still to make their 100 tortillas a, tie, a meal for their family. Um, there was one um, house that had a big motor and they were able to hook it up to a corn grinder. And so the women could come in and three times a day or twice a day, depending on what they wanted to do, grind their corn. But that diesel engine was in the house of this family. And so they would strum it up and it would just go and the whole house would fill with smoke. And they didn't understand that that was probably toxic for all. So the little kids would be there I mean, sleeping still through this all, or you know, they'd accommodate themselves. But in order to have electricity, this is how it was. You had to strum up the, the diesel engine and breathe in the smoke to have a little bit less of a challenge for your life. So how we, who have the ability to do engineering, have changed night so that our eyes work. We change things and yet there's privileged parts of looking at where the most concentration of light is. What does that mean? And then this, you know, the Greek mythology is always kind of interesting to see where some pre-Christian thoughts were on how these things happened, how they defined um, the forces of the world with personas of this Nyx, uh, the daughter of chaos and her children, sleep, death, tribes of, tribe of dreams, strife and doom and Eros. And how at night we see all of those come forward and how there's still an understanding of darkness is first and then light comes out of darkness. And where does our mind and the, the chaos that when we wake up in the middle of the night and naming it chaos and where our mind goes in those places. And then how the stars, the astronomy of it all that, I mean, I remember we were in middle school where we learned that it takes light seven minutes to get from the sun to us. And so the sun could have exploded seven minutes ago, but we wouldn't know until seven minutes later. So every, every minute it's like, oh, the sun was alive seven minutes ago. Um, and just that fatalistic view of the stars of the three billion, half billion years old and it's finally getting to us. We can't even fathom that. Now this part of, and I, this has come into some theological circles, this next part, I don't quite love it at all about how that, you know, the essential building blocks of creation have always been there. The carbon, well, since God created them, that's a, Christian, a little bit of a Christian part, but the carbon and oxygen and, and iron and all those elemental 
elements have been there and they just get formed and connected through those, those bonds of um, molecules. And so they are, they're universal and they've kind of traveled around the whole universe so that our pencil lead might have been made in Orion. Now there's those that like now that lens coming up that sometimes put the 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 um, cross on the forehead and say that you are stardust and to stardust you will return. I have a major issue with that. I don't know how major, I'm not gonna be melodramatic. I don't like that because it, we're not just random elements pushed together. That's we're more than that. We are created by a creator. There's intention, there is um, design, there is beauty, there is life. Um, we are God's children. And so we're not just universal accidents or our mode. Yeah, but it also is fascinating to think that we've been connected, that what makes us up are those basic building blocks of the entire universe. So perspective there, it'd be interesting to hear what you all think about that. It's kind of fun to think that I'm stardust, it makes me feel maybe a little bit more important, but at first, but then I would say it makes me feel less. Um, while part of me might have been on the other side of the Milky Way at one point, is that the part to, to revel in and to um, be in awe of in part is kind of cool, or the fact that God brought those elements together to make me and to make you and um, and that, that phenomenal piece that God continues to create and sustain all of the universe. So in this chapter today, some just, I think, um, things to chew on a little bit of, of light and the disparity of the inequity, inequity um, equality of that, some stories about light and dark, but then also um, that universal peace, I'd be curious to kind of have you wrestle with that as well, of where are we in the universe? How are our atoms connected to the rest of the universe? Be still and know that I am God. You have been born anew through the living and abiding word of God. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Mighty God of mercy, we thank you for the resurrection dawn bring in the glory of our risen Lord who makes every day new. Especially we thank you for the sustaining goodness of your creation. We thank you that out of atoms, out of elements, that you form us, that you mold us, that you give us life, breathing your life into us and sustaining that life. Remind us of, of your presence, of your majesty, give us the awe and help us see that we're connected in that way to all that you have created and to be better stewards of it perhaps or recognize the, the fragile beauty and amazing complexity of what you have done and continue to do. We ask for those who don't have time to contemplate that. We ask for those who are overwhelmed by whether they're important or not to you. And we ask that the good news that you do regard us. And that's one of the amazing things about you being God and not us, that you can do that. You can care for each individual piece of your creation, person in your creation, regard them and revel in them. Or we sometimes have trouble just doing it for the people around us, God. May you give us that cooperation with one another and sustain us. For the new creation in Christ and all gifts of healing and forgiveness, we pray for those who are mourning this day, the loss of loved ones. We have quite a long list in our church community of those who are mourning this day. We also pray for those who are hospitalized and ill, those who are in the midst of treatment, those who are in physical therapy, those who are in occupational therapy, those who are in therapy. May you provide ways to wholeness and health and, and wellness for us. 
May you forgive when we have fallen short and we fail to trust. And may you create ways forward to our well, for our well-being. For the gift of relationship with others, we rejoice. May you continue to bless us with one another and help us name the fact that it's a blessing. For the communion of faith in your church, we give thanks for the church throughout the world and the important work that we have for the celebration of our life together and for the coming together of two, two stars or alignment of planets that happens without our, without anything from us and that we can see it and we can rejoice in it. May you bring us together in ways that we, we can't fathom, but for the good of our world. Merciful God of might, renew this weary world, heal the hurts of all your children and bring about your peace for all in Christ Jesus, the living Lord. Especially we pray for those who govern nations of the world. We pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris. We pray for our three branches of government. We pray for our local government. We pray for all of the, the changes and challenges and hopes and worries of the first hundred days of a president's time in office. May you create a way forward for all of us in this country for the domestic tranquility, <laughs> for the um, health and well-being, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, those ideals that we hold. May you help us um, continue to work for them for people in countries ravaged by strife or warfare or pa the pandemic, we pray. We lift up especially this day, Miramar and the um, coup that happened there. We pray for Ansan Sushi and Sushi. I can't pronounce it, I'm sorry, God, do you know her name? And um, the citizens of that country. We pray for all of the world that is bound in this reality of COVID-19. We give thanks for vaccinations and we ask that they continue to be distributed. We pray that we can get ahead of this thing, Lord. We pray and we hope, we worry, and we hand it to you because we, you've promised to provide life, to sustain it, and to be with us. For all who work for peace and international harmony, we pray. And for all who strive to save the earth from carelessness and destruction, without the universe, may we be in awe, Lord, and may we care for what you have created. For the Church of Jesus Christ in every land, we thank you and we ask you to be with, especially Creator Lutheran Church and Preschool in this coming month. Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. In all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us this day. Amen.